Hey, good morning. Thanks for joining us today. My name's Jim Doer, preaching guy with the Astoria Christian Church here in Astoria, Oregon. Today we are at the Ricola Farm on Wireless Road, just across the Young's River Bridge here in Warrington. We're at a sheep farm because we're going to be talking about Psalm 23. We are at Psalm 23 in our Core 52 series. Today we're going to be talking about Jesus, the Good Shepherd, and what David had to say about what our shepherd would look like. In his sermon on Psalm 23, Dan Raymond, who's a preacher in Missouri, points out that the world is in desperate need of a shepherd. The world's a dangerous place. Lots of predators, lots of circumstances that create havoc in people's lives. And he wonders, where are we going to find that shepherd? Are we going to find it in Washington, D.C.? Can the government be an effective shepherd of its people? And I think just given the COVID crisis alone, the answer is a resounding no. Government, any government, is notoriously corrupt, self-serving, greedy, and politicians have earned a bad name for good reason. American churches have, uh, for decades, believed that if they had the right government and power, that it could change the country, and it just seems to be getting worse. So I think it's safe to say that government is not a suitable shepherd for, the, for anybody. How about Wall Street? How about big corporations? Can they shepherd us? Can you really put your faith in Amazon or Facebook? Any of the big companies, you really think they care about you? Have you ever called their customer service line? And a lot of these companies are censoring Christian speech and, and espousing clearly anti-Christian value systems and lifestyles. No, the answer certainly cannot be in big corporations or Wall Street. All they want is your money and your data. Dan says, how about academia? Again, a resounding no. He calls them cesspools of foolishness, masquerading as wisdom. We spend a ton of money, put our kids through four years of college just to have them undo what as parents we've tried to instill in them for 18 years. Critical race theory, all sorts of bizarre gender fluidity theories now, homosexuality. Uh, the list goes on of, of how academia and, and what they put forth as, as studies now, just horrible, just a waste. It makes you giggle just to read some of the curriculums of some of our major schools. So the answer is clearly not found in academia. The answer isn't even found in a lot of churches. There's a lot of churches that have gone away from the Bible. They spend their time now trying to deconstruct the Bible, trying to convince their members why the Bible doesn't mean what it says or doesn't say what we think is said for, for generations. They're changing everything. Uh, grace is now a, a license to do whatever you want. God just thinks whatever you do is fantastic, uh, as opposed to grace being something that transforms you into the image of God and conforms your life into that which pleases God, and, and that puts a smile on his face. A lot of churches now, not just the scandals like in the Roman Catholic Church, but our own churches, Protestant evangelical churches, lots of scandals. Sad to say, Many churches are not even suitable to shepherd our lives. But 2,500 years ago, King David knew exactly where to go for a shepherd. We don't know if he wrote this when he was a teenager and maybe he'd taken care of Goliath already. Maybe he... Uh, was king and he was on his deathbed. We, we don't know when this was written uh, in his life, but, but it was very clear to him who his shepherd was and who your shepherd should be. Psalm 23, reading from the ESV. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. 
Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Probably one of the most famous passages of the Bible, even non-Christians who have zero contact with the church, they're quite familiar with Psalm 23 because it's everywhere, especially at funerals. What I want to do today is just walk down verse by verse, just talk about uh, the type of shepherd that you have and that God wants to be for your life. And I want to encourage you, if you're a follower of Jesus, <laughs> this is your shepherd. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, but you're just kind of watching this because you're interested to see what all this Christian stuff is all about, I hope that your heart starts beating faster and you say, man, that's exactly who I need to watch over my life. Let's start right at the beginning. The Lord. <laughs> the Lord. The God of Israel, the Creator God, the Lord, is my shepherd. Not Moloch, not Baal, not Asherah, none of the Old Testament Canaanite gods. The Lord. Not Mohammed, not Buddha, <laughs> not the sun, not the stars, not the moon. Not the government, not the university, not Wall Street. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. He said, the Lord is. Present tense. Pay attention to the verbs in the Bible. The Lord is. Not the Lord will be, not the Lord was, not the Lord might be, not the Lord could be. The Lord is my shepherd. Is he your shepherd? Can you say that? The Lord is my shepherd. My shepherd. That's a powerful word. Two little letters. My. He's my shepherd. It's not my mom's shepherd. Not my grandfather's shepherd. Not my dad's shepherd. Not my kid's shepherd. Not my grandparent's shepherd. Not my spouse's shepherd. He's my shepherd. It's a personal thing. The God of the universe wants to be your shepherd. Do you know him? Is he your shepherd? Can you say that? The Lord is my shepherd. Jesus said in John chapter 10, the passage where he claims to be the good shepherd, he said, the good shepherd knows his own and they know him. Do you know your shepherd? Is he your shepherd? And then look what David says. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. There's lots of other things he could have said here. He could have said that, that the Lord is my potter, and that would have been true. He could have said the Lord is my farmer. He could have said that the, the Lord is my fountain or my rock or, or the mighty lion of Judah. Or he could have said the Lord is my fortress. He's my redeemer. He could have said the Lord is my father. He, he, but he chose shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. The shepherd guards and gives and guides, as we'll see in just a moment. He says, I shall not want. <laughs> that means I will, I will lack nothing essential. My shepherd supplies my needs. This doesn't mean that he's going to give you every little whim, every little desire that you or I have, but he gives us what we need. It's like the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, My God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. There's a little Sunday school student who tried to recite this psalm, and he said, The Lord is my shepherd. That's all I want. 
bad memory. Good theology. The Lord is my shepherd. That's all I want. You, you don't need more from God, which is what a lot of our prayers are. Gimme, 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 gimme. What we need is more of God himself. And what you're going to find is the more that, that you experience and know God, the less you're actually going to need stuff. It's kind of cool how that works. Hey, we're, we're inside the car now. It's really windy out there, and the rain is starting to come again. And uh, that's kind of hard on my Bible. It messes it up really bad. But if you look out the window there, I'll have Jude, my camera guy, just kind of, I don't know if you can see it real well, but there is a large flock of sheep out there, and they're kind of running. They should be heading this way here um, fairly soon. It's almost feeding time. There's a great big fat one lying down over here. He's just eyeballing us. There's an alpaca out there somewhere. It's actually their guard dog is, is uh, what they call it. But we're just going to huddle down inside here. It's a little bit easier on my crew and, uh, and on my equipment and, and just see if we can wrap it up in here. Uh, we talked about I shall not want. And, and the next thing David says is he makes me lie down in, in green pastures. And, and that's what sheep need for food if you if you just look out here i mean it's 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 a perfect environment for sheep they they can just eat to their hearts content where david was in bethlehem and judea uh, it could be hard to find those green pastures there was the harsh judean wilderness not too far away uh, but what he's saying here is is god our shepherd he he provides green pastures which which means you don't have to go anywhere else you don't have to look and keep on looking. He leads you to the place where you are satisfied and well-fed spiritually. And I know so many people that that does not describe. They are, they are constantly looking for something better or deeper or more. And it's, it's right here in a relationship with our shepherd. David goes on to say, he leads me beside still waters, still waters. Not, not a raging flood that can be hard to drink from or, or be a threat to the sheep. Not muddy, murky water. Like if you look out here where we were just standing, there is some yucky water. But if you look over here, there's a, a great big tank that looks like it holds maybe 100 gallons. And that's fresh water that's always there for the sheep. And, and so the, the shepherd knows how to uh, give you what you need. Those are the two things the sheep has to have. Food and water. And, and so what David is talking here is he, he's talking about satisfaction and sufficiency. He's talking about rest and contentment. He's talking about a life that, that is free from anxiety. God's got you. Green pastures, still water. Yeah. Let that sink in. Enjoy that. Does that describe your life? Does that describe your relationship with God? He says he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He restores my soul. That's what many of us need. I'm going to guess if you're not a follower of Jesus, you're wondering, can my soul be restored? <laughs> Is it too far gone? He leads me in paths of righteousness. Sheep are dumb animals. They put their head down and they eat the grass and they can get lost very easily because they're not paying attention to what's around them, just like human beings. I mean, there's a reason we are compared to sheep. Now, not that we're totally stupid. I mean, we're pretty smart people. We just landed on Mars for Pete's sake and we're exploring space and learning all sorts of stuff. But morally and life choice wise, a lot of us are just plain dumb. I am. I'm glad that I have a shepherd who restores my soul, who, who is willing to lead me uh, out of the dangerous situations that I have put myself in. Have you ever done that? Just get so caught up in, in, in satisfying your appetites like a sheep 
And next thing you know, you you are in a really a really bad predicament. We talked about David living in Bethlehem, not too far from the Judean wilderness, and, and there were cliffs, and there were predators, there were other animals out there that would just love to grab a sheep. We have spiritual enemies who would love to seize us from, from the pen of the Good Shepherd. Jesus talked about the sheep that gets lost in the Gospels. He, he says that the Good Shepherd leaves the 99 sheep. And he goes to find the one. That's how important it is for him to get all of his sheep back. It's what he's done for you. He wants to restore you back into his fold, back into his care. He wants to be your shepherd. No matter how far you've strayed, odds are... Maybe you were in the fold once and you strayed. I know lots of people that named Jesus and were baptized perhaps as kids and, and then they got away from it and, and now they're really far away from the shepherd. And what I just want you to know if that describes you is your shepherd has not given up looking for you. He's coming after you <laughs> and he is intent on leading you back to where it's safe because he loves you and he knows that's where you need to be. And then he says, probably the most famous part of this psalm. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. This is read at almost every funeral, especially if it's the funeral of a, of a Christian of some sort. But he's not talking just about death, although it is the valley of the shadow of death, but that can also be translated as the, the valley of deep darkness. The valley of deep darkness. Did you ever go through a valley of deep darkness? I'm going to guess yes. <laughs> I think we all have. Valleys of deep darkness, depression, anxiety, crippling anxiety. Um... PTSD from that, that, that one event in your life. Maybe it was a sexual assault. Maybe, maybe it was a military action. Some trauma in your past can be a dark valley. Uh, debt can be a dark valley. You don't think you're ever going to see the light of day again. We had that. Years ago, my wife and I, we know what it's like. Loneliness, oh my gosh, if, if, I, if I just had a friend. Loneliness can be a really, a really deep, dark valley. I had a conversation today with, with a guy who's, who's concerned because uh, his friend's daughter, who's 41, is a heroin addict. And a dad's and a mom's concern for their kid. I have another preacher friend of mine. He's got a teenage son that's in juvie because of drugs. It's Maybe your dark valley is something that a family member is putting you through. Maybe your dark valley is a divorce that, that you're going through. Maybe it's a divorce you didn't want. Maybe your spouse, for whatever reason, just is done with you. Or maybe, maybe you need to divorce because the situation is so dangerous and toxic for everyone's safety. You've, you've got to get away. The, the list is endless. Even though I walk the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. That's, that's what I want you to get from this, is no matter what your valley is, you don't have to go through it alone. You don't have to be afraid, even though it's scary. Your, your shepherd is going to see you through it. And that's encouraging. We need that encouragement sometimes. A lot of times. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Rod and staff, the tools of the trade for a shepherd. Maybe they're used to count the sheep. Maybe they're used to defend the sheep from 
predators, lions, wolves, jackals, snakes, whatever is out there that might hurt them. Odds are the, the shepherd would use one of those tools to kind of go through the wool as, as he's checking to make sure, are there any sores? Are there any wounds? Did, did my sheep get into some thorns or branches? Or, or if they took a fall, uh, what is their condition? So uh, he's got the tools to examine his sheep to know what kind of shape they're in. Sometimes he would use these tools uh, to guide and to correct, maybe to prod. He wants to lead the sheep a certain place and, and they, they might be resistant. And so he's, he's got to uh, motivate the sheep. And the Bible certainly says that God will discipline us. He will prod us. He will move us. And Hebrews 12 says sometimes that's not very comfortable. I read a book one time uh, that talked about uh, sometimes the shepherd will even break the sheep's leg especially in the case of, of like a, a, a mother you that, that is stubborn and she thinks that she can lead the flock better than the shepherd and, and when she continuously will lead the younger sheep away, that the shepherd will actually break the leg and force that sheep to stay close to him. It protects the others, but it also protects that sheep. Sometimes, sometimes... Sometimes God is going to have to hurt you, but it's for your own good. And I find that helpful when I go through difficult times. Well, what is, what is God trying to do with me here? And of course, if, if it was a hooked shepherd's staff, then, then if the sheep was out of reach, the shepherd could use it to uh, pull the sheep back to safety from the ledge or wherever it had fallen into. Now, the, the Bible says that God has tools that he uses to shepherd you and me. We have his word. We have the Bible, which is why we're doing Core 52, which is why I'm just trying to help you get familiar with the core passages of the scripture. We're going through this every week to learn more and more about God and his nature and his character and how he works and what we can expect and, and what he expects of us. So God's word is a, is a huge tool. If you're not studying it, learning it, memorizing it, reading it, being familiar with it, then your worldview is going to be shaped by something other than the word of God. And you're going to find yourself making decisions you're going to regret because they're not in line with the Word of God. And it's, it's, it's amazing. I belong to a preacher's group every Wednesday. There's 30 or 40 of us on a Zoom call. And the things that we pastors take for granted that our people know from the Scriptures. So we've just constantly got to encourage you to get back to the Scriptures. That's a tool that God has to shepherd you. He has the church. He has other believers, other Christians, other followers of Jesus. And they are there to encourage you to make the right decisions, and, and when you make the right decision, if it's a hard decision, to encourage you that, that God will honor this because it's the right decision, they're there to warn you. Sometimes we, we go down some really bad paths as followers of Jesus, and because we're not well connected with a church body, there's no one there to say, hey, you might want to rethink that because this will not end well. And of course, when we're baptized into Jesus, we, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have this mysterious but assured presence of God within us who works through our conscience and our thoughts and slowly moves us closer to looking like our shepherd, Jesus Christ. These tools God uses. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. This is amazing. This is, this is God. This is God as your shepherd. He is, he is hosting a dinner in your honor. This is marvelous, intimate <laughs> hospitality. But notice who's present at this meal. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. We're not exactly sure what the enemies are doing at this table. Either you've conquered them or you've come to some sort of peace treaty arrangement with them. But the, the cool thing is that there is no enemy that you can face that God can't provide victory 
or peace with them. Let me say it again. There's no enemy that you can face, but that God can't provide victory or peace with them. And the cool thing is, the shepherd's there. The shepherd has set this table in the presence of your enemies. The shepherd's going to take care of you. You don't have to fight all these battles by yourself. Now, this comes home for me. Some of you know my story that my dad died five years ago, and for 10 years before my dad died, he had cut me off. We had zero relationship whatsoever. I wanted it. He didn't want to consider reconciling at all. We were estranged for 10 years, and then he died. I was left out of the funeral. I was left out of the obituary. It's like I never existed. So in one sense, I think that qualifies as my dad was my enemy. I, I didn't feel that he was my enemy, but he felt that I was his enemy. And, and where this psalm brings me consolation and encouragement is in the presence of God, in the presence of my shepherd, my dad's not my enemy. God would take care of my dad. And I hope that someday when, when I go, that on the other side of the grave, my dad and I will be able to sit and, and it will be like nothing ever happened. I, I'm not worried about that because my shepherd has got that. And I got a lot of peace from that. I grieved over the loss of the relationship, but I was encouraged from knowing my shepherd had it under control. Your shepherd is going to fight your fight for you. And boy, that just takes a burden off of you. It's not all on you. You trust your shepherd. David goes on, he says, You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. That word anoint literally means make fat. So he could be saying, You make fat my head. As you sit there with a close up of my fat head in the car. I'm sorry, no fat head jokes. Oil, typically olive oil pressed down, was, was, was a healing balm. It was, it was used for sores and wounds. And it wasn't just a little dab. The shepherd would have a flask, and he would just pour it out and massage it in. And there's plenty of healing balm for whatever your hurt and your wound is. The cup overflows. I don't know, I, I, in my research, is that a cup of oil? Is, I think it's a cup of wine. Uh, Psalm 104, verse 14, the psalmist says that God provides wine to gladden man's heart. That God has provided wine. It's, it's, it's part of sitting at table with God and the presence of our enemies. There's all over the world when, when you eat with someone, there's usually wine as a common denominator. And, and that's okay. This, this is a picture of intimate hospitality. It, it reminds me of Luke chapter 7, where, where Jesus is invited to the home of Simon the Pharisee. You remember that story? And, and there's this sinful woman that comes in, and she starts washing Jesus' feet with her tears and her hair, and she pours oil on his feet. And, and Simon the Pharisee is like, what is going on here? And then Jesus rebukes him. He didn't do any of that stuff. He was a horrible host. And so we know that in Israel, this, this, if you're a good host, it involves oil and wine and just doing the decent thing for your guest, being a good, hospitable host. But the coolest thing, I think, is the idea that God, God can heal your deepest wounds. Just like the shepherd could look over his sheep and pour the oil and healing where it's necessary. Um, God can anoint you where you're cut the deepest. We all have deep wounds. And, and that's where God does his best work. And he's got that for you in abundance. We're getting close to the end. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. 
that valley of deep darkness that we talked about, the valley of the shadow of death, it's temporary, my friend. It's temporary. This life and what we go through here, it's temporary. We, we have the hope of another home. There's more to life than this life. A friend of mine in Northern Virginia is a pastor and a little over a year ago his house burned down and he's got a bunch of kids. He's got a couple of his own and then he's adopted a bunch of, of uh, medical needs, kids from uh, China and some other countries. A beautiful, giving, loving, generous family and their house burned down. Today, Jock posted on Facebook what he wrote about the closing of his house. He finally had it all restored and now they're selling it and they're moving. And, and he's, he writes very poignantly how difficult it is to say goodbye to this place where they have lived for a number of years and, and made all sorts of memories together as a family. It's hard to say goodbye. But he says that going through this process is a reminder for him not to get too attached to the stuff of earth. And he's right. He says, I don't want to get to the end of my life and find that I'm homeless, that all my hope has been placed in an address or in a bank account or in a stock portfolio. His home is on the other side of death with the shepherd. He's going to live with him forever. Is that your hope? Maybe you're young and you're in your teens or 20s or early 30s and you're like, I'll worry about that later. Man, number one, you may not have later. And number two, if you don't start with that as a priority now, it's really hard after you've got a couple decades of lifestyle and and habits and thinking patterns to start to set your sights on what's truly our home. I hope that's your hope. Max Licato writing about Psalm 23 asks the question, he says, uh, let, let, me, let me meddle in your life a little bit. He says, how do you answer this question? I'll be happy when? It's a good question. I want you to, I want you to wrestle with that. I want you wherever you are. I'll be happy when. What, what is it going to take to make you happy? And he offers some suggestions. Uh, I'll be happy when I'm healed of this disease, this illness. I'll be happy when I get this promotion at work. I'll be happy when I'm married. I'll be happy when I'm single. I'll be happy when I get a boyfriend. I'll get a girlfriend. I'll be happy when I own this car or that house or that toy. Or when I, when I get this new skill, I'll be happy when. How, how, how do you answer that question? And then he follows that up with, what happens if that never happens? What if you never get that promotion? What if you, ever, you never get that income? What if it goes the other direction? What if you never meet that person or they say no? What if that diagnosis doesn't change and it gets worse. What, what happens then? It's a very good question. He says, could you still be happy? And then if the answer is no, he says, you're sleeping in a cold prison cell of discontent. And you need to know what you have in your shepherd. I like that. If you're waiting on something to make you happy, and if that doesn't happen, then you can't see yourself being happy. Then you have built yourself a prison of discontent. And some of the unhappiest people I know are those people who are not content with their lives. And you know that, and you know some people like that, and maybe that's you. Max goes on to describe the God who is your shepherd. 
a God who hears you, the power of love behind you, the Holy Spirit within you, grace for every sin, direction for every turn, a candle for every corner, an anchor for every storm. He's everything you need. And who can take it from you? Can leukemia infect your salvation? Can bankruptcy impoverish your prayers? He says our tornado or fire can take your earthly house, but what can touch your heavenly house? And he says, look at your position. Why clamor for prestige and power? Are you not already privileged to be part of the greatest work in the world? Man, as a follower of Jesus, you get to participate in things that really matter. You get to serve your church. You get to serve your community in the name of Jesus, which means there is a reward out there one day. Nothing you do for Jesus will go unrewarded. Why, why do you need anything else? Then Max says, say it slowly. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He says, say it again. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He says, say it again. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. And then he says, what's that sound? Do you hear the sound of a jail door? beginning to open. Isaiah chapter 53, which is a chapter we referenced last week, it talks about how Jesus, or the coming Messiah, would be a suffering servant. In Isaiah 53, he writes that we all, like sheep, have gone astray. <laughs> We've all turned to our own way. That's The world has done that. The world is in rebellion against God. America has certainly done that. Churches have done that. You've done that. I've done that. We've all gone our own way. That's our fundamental human problem. It's called sin. We've all chosen our way over the shepherd's way. And then shockingly, Isaiah goes on to say, And the Lord has laid on him, the suffering servant he's writing about, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Every sin, every wandering. You have a shepherd who would love to bring you home. The Lord is my shepherd. Is he your shepherd? Hey again, thanks for joining us today. I'm Jim Dewar, Preaching Guy with the Astoria Christian Church here in Astoria, Oregon, the Pacific Northwest, 1151 Harrison Avenue, 1030 on Sunday mornings. If you're in the area, we would love to have you stop by and join us. We are at the Ricola Farm on Wireless Road on a windy, wet Friday afternoon. Although when you're watching this, it's Sunday morning. Shh, pretend you didn't hear that. Anyway. We're glad we got to spend some time with you and talking about Psalm 23. If you have any questions, just shoot me an email, and I'd love to help you find your way back into the Lord's flock. Have a great week. See you next week.